gentlemen, distinguished guests, Colonel Ralph Puckett. Thank you very much for that very complimentary introduction. I came from a small town, Tifton, Georgia, maybe six to 8,000 people when I was there. I had a very loving family, a father, mother, sister who was eight years older and a younger brother, two and a half years older. My father was my hero. He was the one that I admired first in the world. I always wanted to be like him and I wanted to make him proud of me. But he taught me some great lessons which have stuck with me and have guided me and have uh, caused me to try to live the way that he would like for me to live. One, be a man, do what's right. You have to be uh, strong enough to take risk and overcome them when you're kicked down, kicked in the teeth. You have to get up and come back again with full steam and overcome anything that you had in your mind. I had my um, 15th birthday when the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor on that date that we got the news. And of course the country was caught up in the war and everybody, those who went into the service and thousands volunteered for, for the services. And I and volunteered in the Army Air Corps Reserve. It was an Air Corps, not force, as soon as I was 17 and was sworn in uh, two weeks after I was 17 in the reserve because I wanted to be part of it. Recognize our volunteer as a ranger. Recognize our volunteer as a ranger. Fully known the hazards of my chosen profession. Fully known the hazards of my chosen profession. I always endeavor to uphold the prestige. I always endeavor to uphold the prestige. Honor. Honor. And high esprit de corps my ranger regiment. High esprit de corps my ranger regiment. And I was in Japan in July of 1950 to be assigned over to one of the divisions in Korea. When uh, I heard over the PA set, Lieutenant Puckett report to such and such a room in the headquarters building, I went in there and gave my snappiest salute to a very sharp looking Lieutenant Colonel, John H. McGee. And uh, he gave me at ease, and of course I stood at a rigid parade rest because I'd never been in front of a lieutenant colonel like that before. And he started off by saying, I'm selecting volunteers for an extremely dangerous mission behind enemy lines. I said, sir, I volunteer. He said, don't you want to know what the job is? I said, yes, sir, but I volunteer. He said, I'm selecting volunteers to form a ranger company. And uh, I said, sir, I've always wanted to be a ranger. Well, he talked to me at some length exploring my background, which was nil, because I didn't have any background being brand new to the Army. And he said, well, unfortunately, I've already selected the lieutenants for the company. I said, sir, I volunteer to be a sergeant or a rifleman if you'll take me into that ranger company. Well, that impressed him. He said, come back tomorrow morning and I will tell you what I've decided. Well, I came back the next morning, gave him another snappy salute, and he said, I've decided to take you into the Ranger Company. He said, not only have I decided to take you in, but you're going to be the company commander. And I said to myself, dear God, don't let me get a bunch of good guys killed because I knew I didn't know enough. I didn't have the experience and I didn't have the knowledge that I felt I needed to be a Ranger Company commander. And I felt I probably didn't have enough to be a rifleman in a Ranger Company either. Acknowledging the fact that a Ranger is a more elite soldier. Acknowledging the fact that a Ranger is a more elite soldier. Who arrives at the cutting edge of a battle by land. Who arrives at the cutting edge of battle by land. Sea. Sea. Or air. Or air. I accept the fact that as a Ranger. I accept the fact that as a Ranger. My country expects me to move further. My country expects me to move further. Faster. Faster. And fight harder than any other soldier. Fight harder than any other soldier. We had our work cut out for us. We, we, our activation date was uh, 25 August, 1950. As soon as we assembled the men and equipment, we moved to South Korea, arriving there on the 2nd of September, and went into 
what was known as the 8th Army Ranger Training Center, which was nothing more than our little detachment plus some overhead. We were in pup tents in the middle of a rice paddy. There were no training facilities, nothing there whatsoever. I came up with a, a vision for the company. This is what I want my ranger company to be. Every ranger will be a tiger. He'll be in the best physical condition of his life. Every ranger will know his stuff. He will be highly qualified in the tactics and techniques of the individual soldier. Third, each small unit, company as a whole, would be trained until it was a combat-ready killing machine. And fourth, every ranger would have the confidence in himself, in his leaders, and in the 8th Army Ranger Company that made him believe that our unit was the best that the United States of America could produce at that time. We implemented those training objectives with our training program, which focused on fundamentals. And I adhered to what Vince Lombardi said about fundamentals. Fundamentals win it. Football is two things. It's blocking and tackling. I don't care anything about formations or new, or new formations or uh, operations or any tricks on defense. If you block and tackle better than the team you're playing, you will win. Never shall I fail my comrades. Never shall I fail my comrades. Always keep myself mentally alert. Always keep myself mentally alert. Physically strong. Physically strong. And morally straight. And morally straight. And I'll shoulder more than my share of the task. And I'll shoulder more than my share of the task. Whatever it may be. Whatever it may be. One hundred percent. One hundred percent. And then some. And then some. And I remember the words of the 25th Infantry Division S3, and I remember what he looks like, and I don't know what his name was, but he said, your job is to go into this area, and he shows it on the map, where no American unit has ever gone before without being ambushed and beaten up. Your job, go in there and combat and reconnaissance patrol. So it fit right into our training. I looked at it as postgraduate work for our training program because it was exactly what we had spent our time on. And we succeeded. We had no casualties during that time. And I attribute the success to the training and outlook of the Rangers. They were physically and emotionally tough. We moved so rapidly on foot, we surprised the recon company who carried us to the jumping off place where we would go up into the mountains on our patrols and how fast we could move on foot. But we'd spent six weeks in the field, double time in everywhere we went. They were able to do it because they had incorporated into, inculcated into their believing, I can do it. I can, that, that, that may look impossible, but I can do it because we've done it before. I didn't have any trouble with uh, rangers falling out. They, they performed. They gave me everything I asked and then some. Get the right, show the world. Get the right, show the world. That I'm a specially selected and well-trained soldier. That I'm a specially selected and well-trained soldier. My courtesy, superior officers. My courtesy, superior officers. Need us to dress. Need us to dress. And carry equipment. Carry equipment. Shall set the example for others to follow. Shall set the example for others to follow. The next morning was bright and early, a beautiful day. Colonel Dolvin, Lieutenant Colonel Dolvin, the task force commander came up and walked out with me and the tank company commander out on the open rice paddy that we were to, the ranger company was to attack over the next, or that afternoon. The ranger company's job was to attack across 800 yards of open, frozen, cleared rice paddy in Seas Hill 205 on the far side. So I went back and I briefed my platoon and we got ready and jumped off sometime in the afternoon, I've forgotten which, riding again as we'd done before on the tanks from behind the mountain to round front. As soon as we got in front, mortar fire, automatic weapons fire, the tank stopped dead, buttoned up. My rangers, I was with the uh, second platoon this time, they jumped off, got behind a dike which was about that high. I ran behind the tank 
and went to the sound powered phone, something I'd learned at Fort Benning. There's a sound powered phone back there and it's in this box and you can open the box and talk to the tank commander. Well, I was pretty perturbed to say the least that they weren't firing. Here we're, my rangers are getting fired at 10 yards in front of the tanks and they're doing nothing with their hatches closed. I couldn't open the sound powered box so I climbed up on the back of the tank and am banging the hatch with my M1 rifle, which is what I carried. And finally, the tank commander opens the hatch about that far, peers out, and again, I use some unprintable words that his job was to be firing. And he says, we've only got four inches of armor protection. As I said, that's four inches more than the field jacket that my rangers have. So he started firing and I jumped off the tank. One of my rangers had written me, he said, that's the most memorable scene from his time in Korea, was me on the tank banging it with the M1 rifle. Immediately after defending, we began to put in a perimeter defense. We always defended 360 degrees because we were always alone. And tonight was to be no different. The closest U.S. Army ground force unit was over a mile away, so we've got to look after ourselves. I picked up one of my rangers who had been helping a wounded Katusa, and he and I were carrying a case of hand grenades each back up the hill. And as we were entering the perimeter, we heard the Chinese blowing the whistles and bugles. That was the way they coordinated with each other. We heard back inside the perimeter, and <clears throat> I got on the radio, which was in my foxhole, got on the radio and, and call, alerted them to what was happening. We immediately, after that, those whistles and bugles ceased sounding. We were hit by mortar barrage and automatic weapons fire and shortly thereafter a shower of hand grenades. I called on artillery and that stopped the assault. We had some casualties, we had stopped the assault. I was wounded by a hand grenade on that first assault. About that time we heard the Chinese blowing the whistles and bugles again so I immediately ran back to the foxhole which was only about 10 yards behind my, behind my perimeter. Got on the radio again and called for artillery. We got artillery right away, right on the concentration that I asked for. Each one of them I called on artillery and always got it immediately and it was the predominant power on the battlefield where we were and really paid off. It saved our necks. At about 0200 to 0230 in the morning, we heard the Chinese blowing the whistles Bugles, always the same thing, same procedure. I ran back to the foxhole, or to my, my foxhole, got on the radio, called for artillery, and the artillery liaison officer said, I can't give it to you. We're firing another mission. I'll give it to you as soon as we complete the mission. I said, we've got to have it. We're under heavy pressure. I'll give it to you when we finish this mission. <clears throat> the pressure increased. I ran back to the foxhole, got on it, same story, we'll give it to you as soon as this mission is fired. I said, we're under great pressure, we're crumbling, we're being overrun. I just gave my unit the word to withdraw. And that was the end of the conversation. Energetically will I meet the enemies of my country. Energetically will I meet the enemies of my country. I shall defeat them on the field of battle. I shall defeat them on the field of battle. For I am better trained. For I am better trained. And will fight with all my might. And will fight with all my might. Surrender is not a ranger word. Surrender is not a ranger word. I will never leave a fallen comrade. I will never leave a fallen comrade. To fall into the hands of the enemy. To fall into the hands of the enemy. And under no circumstances. And under no circumstances. Will I ever embarrass my country. Will I ever embarrass my country. I'd been wounded three times by then, and I was lying there on the foxhole, uh, unable to do anything. And I could see three Chinese about 15 yards away from me, and they were bayoneting or shooting some of my wounded rangers who were in the foxholes, who most of the rangers had been pulled back, and they were shooting or bayoneting my rangers, when all of a sudden, two of my rangers charged up the hill, Private First Class Billy G. Walls, Private First Class David L. Pollock. 
came over where I was lying on the ground. Wall said, sir, you hurt? I thought that was the dumbest question I'd ever heard in my life. But I didn't say that to Walt. I said, I'm hurt bad. I can't move, leave me behind. Walt hands his rifle to Pollock. Walt was a big man, still is. Picks me up, throws me over his shoulder and starts staggering down a very steep mountain face with Pollock giving cover and fire. We were crashing through the brush and the Chinese had advanced to the top of the hill and could hear us. I, I'm sh pretty sure they didn't see us. They fired in our direction, but it's what I called inaccurate fire. They were firing blindly, so it was not as bad as it might sound. We went <clears throat> maybe 150 yards or so, and Walt puts me down on the ground and says, Sir, you're too heavy. I can't carry you any further. With that, he and Walt each grabbed a wrist and dragged me the rest of the way to the bottom of the hill on my backside. Not very ceremonially, but we made it. They made it. I certainly am pleased and glad that Walt and Pollock disobeyed my order to leave me behind on the hill. If so, I, you wouldn't be talking to me. I wouldn't be talking to you today. They saved my neck. Friendly wide display. Friendly wide display. The intestinal fortitude required. The intestinal fortitude required. And fight on to the ranger objective. Fight on to the ranger objective. And complete the mission. And complete the mission. Though I be the lone survivor. Though I be the lone survivor. Well, when I think of uh, uh, Colonel Puckett, uh, the value certainly of selfless service, integrity, and putting team before self um, it embodies uh, his, uh, his, his time in uniform. But more importantly, I think what he did after he took the uniform off and how he's lived his life uh, by serving others, uh, you, you know, whether it's here in the Columbus community or the generations of young leaders, NCOs and officers that he's mentored uh, either directly here at Fort Benning or even outreach across our Army uh, is, uh, is really what we all look up to and say that's, that's the example that I should follow is uh, what uh, Colonel Puckett has done. And, and he certainly served that for me as I got ready to take the uniform off and, and think about you know, what my purpose would be and why I want to do what I want to do is really trying to live up to the example of Colonel Puckett. Yeah, Ralph is, he has always set the example for others to follow. He's distinguished in his own you know, military resume, but he's humble about it. He's, um, he adds a modesty and he adds just some dignity to every event that he's a participant in. He's our hero. He's a, he's a Rangers Ranger and someone that uh, every one of us is deeply, deeply proud to have, have known and been in his company. The Ranger Creed is a concept. It's not a poem. It's not, it's not six paragraphs of rounded word. It's a concept. And, and uh, when you talk about someone who understands there's something bigger than yourself, that you exist in this world to make things better for other people, that's where you get your real satisfaction. And that's, what, you know, that's the story of, of Colonel Puckett. When Sergeant Major Gentry wrote the Ranger Creed, he was probably looking at, at Colonel Puckett, but he didn't, he didn't realize that you know, there was actually a person who embodied all that, but uh, that, that was Colonel Puckett. It's, it's standard ethics that uh, I think everybody you know, can and should, should live by. It. I think Ralph Puckett's impacted all of our lives and careers. I got to know him when I was the second Ranger Battalion Commander and then got to work with him closely when I was a regimental commander. And he shaped me. He was an example. He was a mentor. He was a friend. And so I watched him help train young rangers, but at the same time he's training one of the older rangers, me. And he taught me what selflessness means. And he showed me what it means to have standards that you live by forever. The fact that Ralph Puckett is being awarded the Medal of Honor now really is a tribute to Ralph Puckett the man, but I think more to his life. What he did on a bullet swept hill in Korea many years ago matters a lot, but he has been an example. He's been a beacon. He's been a guidepost for so many of us for so long. And now to have him recognized with the medal that I believe he has deserved for decades just feels right. You know, Ralph Puckett being awarded the Medal of Honor, I think it's, it's kind of 
it's it's just the nation doing right by him and and everything that he has he has done and did uh you know as you as you look back and you you read the stories of that time you hear uh you hear the uh kind of the oral testimony of the people that he served with and it's truly someone that has incredibly deserving of this award and uh it's been a long time coming and we're we're just thrilled as an organization uh that that he is going that he is going to receive this award coming into this environment and not only knowing what he did in Korea and just all of his accolades and awards and achievements and everything, but the fact that most of the Ranger instructors and leaders that I, that I spoke with, he was out at every Ranger, you know, the rap week at the start of it. I, it's like, holy smokes. I mean, 90 something years old and he's still out there every day and he is that model and you know someone that we, we will always look up to and we will, we'll be talking about him probably likely for the total existence of the u.s army ranger school rather people have you know personal interaction or know him and i just thank god that you know in within my lifetime not because he's a medal of honor recipient but i was able to you know meet that man hear his story and then see him in action that, that's awesome for me uh, Colonel Puckett was, he, he built a legacy that was worth emulating uh, for all the young Rangers. I think my favorite stories uh, are what I hear every day. They're the stories that soldiers relay, uh, stuff that will never make it onto a book or make it onto a screen. Um, but it's the words of inspiration that he gives to a young Ranger student at the PT test. It's, you know, several years ago, middle of the night, halfway through the foot march route for the best Ranger competition. Colonel Puckett's out there when it's dark cheering on the Rangers. He and I were both in Vietnam. I got there just about time he left. Didn't really run into him again until I retired here at Fort Benning. And we resumed our friendship. And I was still amazed at how much he loved the Army and wanted to be a part of it. Uh, Ralph and I have sort of grown old together here at Benning. I've enjoyed being with him. I look on him as uh, probably one of the best things I did in the Army was make friends with Ralph Puckett. He's a legend in the Ranger. And so uh, it, it was, It was. whenever you heard that name, you knew exactly who they were talking about. The life he's led is a amazing example for many on how to live a good life and how to constantly be positive and make positive impacts. Is there anything else to say about Ralph Puckett? I think it's the same thing most of us should say. Thank you. Thanks for being who you are. Thanks for doing what you did. Thanks for making each of us just a little better than we would have been had you not come our way. So thanks.